Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on the evolution, status, and future of organic no-till in the Northeast U.S. presented by Bill Curran, Stephen Mursky, and Bill Mason. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find information about upcoming webinars, as well as articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website, along with all our many other archived webinars on organic farming topics. We're very excited to have Bill Curran, Stephen Mursky, and Bill Mason presenting this webinar. Bill Curran is a professor of weed science in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Penn State University. Bill's extension and research programs focus on integrated weed management and weed management in conservation tillage systems, including cover crops in conventional and organic-based cropping systems. Stephen Mursky is a research ecologist for the USDA ARS in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. Dr. Mursky has a research background in evaluating the multifunctional role of cover crops and their integration into agroecosystems for soil, crop, and weed management. Dr. Mursky is responsible for the weed, soil, and crop management activities at Beltsville Agricultural Research Center and on-farm experiments in Maryland. Bill Mason, our farmer presenter, runs Mason Heritage Farm located near Queen Anne, Maryland. Bill and Suzanne Mason are fourth, the fourth generation to operate the business. The farm consists of 850 acres, most of which is dedicated to grain production. In 2005, they transitioned 190 acres to organic production and they currently have 500 acres of certified organic grain. On the farm, they use no-till production methods to help with weed suppression and nutrient management relying heavily on cover crops. After their 45-minute presentation, you will have the chance to ask them questions. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you don't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll read the questions out loud and answer as many as we have time for in the 30-minute question period following the presentation. Because we have a large number of people registered, not everyone may get their questions answered, but we'll give you some resources if you have additional questions that haven't been answered after the webinar. So now, um, John, if you could hand over the screen control to our first speaker, Bill Curran. Bill, just click on your screen once to activate it. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Curran with Penn State University. And what we're going to do today is sort of go through, uh, well, as the title says, the evolution, status, and future of uh, organic no-till uh, and some of the projects that we've been involved with here in the Northeast. Um, <clears throat> we're fortunate enough to have Stephen Mursky with the USDA and then Bill Mason, uh, our farmer, to, to, to share the experience. So I'm going to start things off, and then <clears throat> we'll pass the baton as we move along here sort of the, uh, the outline for today, uh, just a, a brief regional perspective, um, sort of where we are and <clears throat> why we're interested in this. Uh, we'll talk about sort of the journey that we've, we've been on uh, using high biomass cover crops uh, in a, a reduced or rotational uh, organic grain production system. Um, Stephen will talk about uh, what sort of crop yields we've been achieving and some of the factors that uh, influence the performance of the crop. And then we'll finish up <clears throat> with Bill Mason uh, who will share some of his experiences uh, in looking at uh, organic uh, no-till. So, uh, say I'll start things off uh, sort of with the, the regional perspective. Uh, I imagine we have a, a number of people from, from different areas uh, across the country. Uh, obviously, we're here in the, the, what we call the Mid-Atlantic region, um, which has some unique uh, attributes. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay uh, is one of those main watersheds that we're, we're all thinking about. Uh, it's a very <clears throat> important uh, invisible watershed uh, in the Northeast that unfortunately has been uh, influenced negatively uh, by agriculture. Uh, we have a lot of diverse agricultural systems here, uh, a high population uh, with, with most of the major uh, eastern seaboard uh, being potential markets. Uh, we have a high density uh, of animal agriculture, particularly dairy and, and, uh, and poultry. Uh, a lot of interest in, in no-till. Uh, our soils are, are well drained. Uh, and so they're very conducive for no-till, but we also are, are plagued with uh, some, some land that may be fairly sloped. Uh, there's a lot of interest in cover crops. There, there has been historically, but it's really uh, <clears throat> uh, of greater interest more today. Uh, and in fact, uh, 
couple of the states, um, Delaware and Maryland are the two that, that come to mind, uh, have some very active incentive programs uh, encouraging farmers to, to grow uh, cover crops. And then, of course, we have a lot of interest in sustainable and, and organic agriculture, and, and that's uh, sort of helped push things um, in, in several directions, uh, and particularly in the organic arena. Um, if we think about organic ag, uh, <clears throat> and particularly in, in the field crop arena, or the, the, the grain productions, historically, uh, we have relied quite a bit on tillage, uh, primarily for, for weed control. And this is a, a figure from an analysis that uh, Dr. Matt Ryan, who, who completed his PhD from Penn State uh, a year or so ago, uh, uh, put together for, for part of his work. And it shows, actually, uh, the figure shows three bars. The, the, the bar on the, on the left is uh, what you might call a, uh, a traditional organic grain production system uh, that's relying on, on uh, manures and then also tillage and things. The bar in the middle is, uh, is an organic rotational no-till uh, system, which is really what we're going to be talking about here today. And then the bar on the right actually is a, an organic system that has, actually has incorporated some perennial hay crops. And what these are showing is the, the energy use within those, those three types of systems. Uh, looking at a number of the inputs there, and what what Matt uh, concluded in this analysis with the organic rotation of no-till was that uh, you use about 27 percent less diesel fuel, about 33 percent less labor, uh, 13 percent less energy, and then your greenhouse gas emissions go down by about 22 percent. So there's a, a number of advantages uh, if we can adopt the rotation of no-till system in terms of, of energy savings. So if we think about uh, what our options are for reducing tillage in organic systems, um, there's three or four things that come to mind. Um, right off the bat, we want to state that, that um, at least that we don't believe that continuous no-till uh, is realistic at this time, in, in, at least in the organic systems that we're involved in, uh, and that being uh, grain crop production, field crop production. Um, some of the ways that we can, we can reduce tillage, uh, we can use perennial crops, as I mentioned, uh, uh, hay crops in particular which uh, would, would rotate you out of that, that need for tillage. Uh, we can reduce tillage intensity. We can use things like chisel plows rather than moldboard plows. Uh, and then finally, we can do things like uh, reduce tillage frequency. Uh, and we would do this by <coughs> relying more on cover crops and maybe altering some of our cultural practices. And this is really the, the focus of the presentation today, uh, that third bullet point. That's really been the, the focus of, of our research uh, and, and what, we'll be, what we'll be talking about. Uh, I mentioned that cover crops uh, are increasing in popularity, and of course they're really a necessity on <clears throat> on our organic farms. Uh, a number of reasons why we're using those, uh, as you see here, and, and we also know that that uh, they can impact pest management. Uh, and really, the focus of our work has been on trying to impact weed management uh, uh, in a positive way. Uh, when we when we manage cover crops uh, in organic systems, we really have uh, a couple of uh, broad options on, on how we control them. Uh, we, could, we could use a cover crop that uh, actually winter kills. In the case, this is a picture of, uh, of spring oats that were seeded in the fall. Uh, they wouldn't survive our winters uh, here in, in, in this region, and so they would naturally winter kill. Uh, the other option typically has been uh, mechanical or, or physical control, and of course the number one option there would be usually tillage, uh, where we might use that cover crop uh, like a green manure. Um, Several years ago, really back in the, the early uh, 2000s, uh, I became very interested in, in other ways of mechanical control of cover crops, and specifically I was interested in, in mowing uh, and started some work looking at uh, you know, timing of mowing and when we could effectively kill rye and, and maybe uh, other crops like, like hairy vetch. Uh, if you look through some of the, <clears throat> the popular publications, the literature, uh, you'll see some, some varying points of view. Uh, this is actually some quotes that I took out of uh, the uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably uh, book from, from SARE, the second edition, uh, and some things for cereal rye uh, for best results, wait until it has begun flowering. Uh, a sickle bar mower is better than a flail mower. Uh, works well after rye has shed pollen. Uh, controlled with a rolling stock chopper after 24 inches tall. Uh, one of the quotes that I liked for Harry Vetch was, uh, once Vetch starts to bloom, it is easily killed by any mechanical treatment. Uh, and so you start to pick these apart and you see some fairly, uh, uh, what I would call, inconsistent uh, results, or at least any uh, uh, 
real routine that you could you could adopt and, and know that you're going to be successful. So uh, I started doing some some small plot research, uh, specifically with rye, uh, looking at critical growth stages for effective mechanical control. And, and obviously, I think most folks would know that that rye being a grass, uh, it's going to grow back. Uh, it's going to re retiller or restool uh, after you mow it up to a certain stage of growth. And so we know that if we see rye like this and we go in and mow it, this would be sort of mid boot stage rye. Uh, that it would that it would recover and, and probably come back and be a pretty nice crop again, um, but as that rye matures, uh, we start to see heads. Uh, you know, maybe we could start to get some control. Uh, do we need to wait for it to be fully headed out? Uh, do we actually need to wait for it to flower? Do we need to see those uh, uh, those anthers uh, or those pollen sacs before we can effectively control it? So I was headed down the the path of uh, starting a fairly large study focused on mowing when uh, I had the opportunity to attend a, a field day. Uh, in 2004 uh, at the Rodale Institute. And probably most people are familiar with the Rodale Institute. It's a, uh, a nonprofit organization based uh, near Kutztown, Pennsylvania, over on the, the southeastern part of the state. Uh, and they had been experimenting with this roller, uh, roller crimper that you see uh, in the photograph, uh, for a year or so at this time. And they had a field day, and they were uh, out explaining their results for it. And I thought this really, really seemed interesting and, and had a lot of potential. And the idea of being able to use a, a roller rather than a mower, uh, which is going to be much less energy intensive and it's going to have a number, the number of other benefits, uh, really uh, gain my interest. Uh, rollers are, are uh, not new. Um, they just haven't widely been used, uh, at least in the United States. But I'm showing some photos. Uh, three out of these four actually are from the, <clears throat> the southern US, um, where there, there has been some adoption of, of rollers. Uh, and of course, probably the, the biggest adoption has been actually in South America or in areas of, of South America. You see a picture from, from Paraguay, uh, Uruguay, Brazil, uh, where some of the, the no-till farmers down there uh, have routinely used rollers for, for a number of years. Uh, so the idea with the, with the roller or roller crimper, uh, as they're, they're called here, uh, is to kill and uniformly place the cover crop on the soil surface. Uh, I mentioned they have been used by some farmers in some parts uh, of the world uh, for a number of years. Uh, we also know that um, they're good on some cover crops and not very good on others. For example, they're not going to be effective on perennials. Uh, they're less effective on legumes than, than grasses. Uh, they tend to be most effective uh, on winter annuals when they're flowering. Uh, and one of the challenges uh, is that it may delay, at least in, in our area of the country, as you move south, this becomes less of an issue, but as you go north, north, it becomes more of an issue. It may delay planting of a cash crop uh, because you're waiting for the, for the cover crop to become uh, susceptible uh, to control. And of course, uh, what sort of started us down this path was, was it could allow uh, no-till production without the, the need for, for herbicides. Uh, if you think about sort of more how we traditionally kill cover crops, uh, and if it, it may be herbicide-based, uh, it could be mowing. Typically, we're going to uh, spread those cover crop residues, uh, or they're going to naturally melt down uh, in more of a random distribution. Uh, and so you're going to end up having gaps and spaces where, where weeds could come through, for example. You're not covering the soil completely. And so one of the ideas and the advantages uh, of this roller crimper is that you're, you're getting in there while the cover crop is still standing. Uh, you're rolling it, in, and you're, you're producing this really nice uniform distribution, uh, which can be uh, really critical. Uh, for, for effective weed control. So uh, after that trip to Rodale, uh, uh, we decided to build a roller. And so we built this, uh, this orange uh, colored roller. I think orange paint was on sale that year, uh, very similar uh, to, to what the Rodale folks had. And, and this is the one that we've been testing in, in most of our work here, at least uh, at, at Penn State. If you're uh, interested in, in that work and, and uh, a little more information, about roller crimpers and sort of where they make sense. This is a publication that we put together uh, that's available. Uh, you can see the website. It's a PDF document that you can uh, <coughs> load up uh, from down below there. So really, the, the first couple of questions that we had uh, were, uh, and we're talking about no-till cover crop mulches, was, was can we kill them with a roller crimper? Uh, what cover crops and when? And then the uh, second was, will they provide adequate weed suppression? Uh, so that we could we could use these in an in organic system. So I'll I'll start off by answering that first question, and then uh, sort of pass the baton to Stephen, and he'll talk a little bit more about the uh, 
the, the wheat suppression piece. So the first thing that, that is uh, you know, very important is that the roller crimper is, is not suitable to control a, a number of cover crops. And I sort of have suitable and not suitable in two columns here. And what you tend to see here are, are the ones that it's suitable for uh, are annuals. Uh, it tends to be pretty good on the, uh, the cereal grains. Uh, and then uh, a select number of, of legumes. That's really sort of where, where we've been focused uh, and not very good on anything that's biennial or perennial. Uh, and certain things that it just doesn't seem to, to, to do a very good good job on. Uh, our focus has really been uh, with hairy vetch and corn uh, and cereal rye and soybean, and, and those systems tend to complement them, themselves very nicely. Uh, hairy vetch being a legume, it's a, a big nitrogen fixer, um, and so it, 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 corn and hairy vetch work very well together. Uh, cereal rye uh, and soybean also work quite well together. Um, and so those are the, that sort of is the, uh, the system, the timing that we, uh, we'd want to control these, those sorts of things uh, that go sort of hand in hand in deciding systems that are going to work. Uh, we have had some experience with the uh, mixtures of cover crops, and that certainly makes it more complicated because um, you're really looking to, to try to uh, synchronize uh, when those cover crops mature and, and be able to roll down them effectively. Uh, as an example, uh, we did some work with the canola variety, Dwarf Essex, uh, several years ago. Uh, this did not work. Uh, we, you, you break off the canola. We did different timings you know, by reproductive development, and you break it off. And you can see the, the photo in the lower, uh, uh, lower right-hand corner where it actually stooled out and, and regrew. Re really sort of how we, we got started on this. Uh, actually, Stephen uh, Mursky used to be a graduate student at Penn State. And for part of his PhD research, um, he sort of took the reins and, and did this large experiment where we looked at uh, planting and termina termination date of cereal rye and uh, whether we could effectively kill it with a roller crimper and, and then how effective was the rye at suppressing weeds. And so I, I thought I'd just sort of quickly tell you some of the results of this because it sort of is the foundation of, of uh, you know, where we are today. Uh, what Stephen did in that experiment is he, we looked at um, six different seeding dates uh, in the fall of the rye. So we seeded rye at two and a half bushels per acre uh, in seven and a half inch rows, starting on the 25th of August, and then about every 10 days until the 15th of October. And then we came in in the springtime uh, in May, starting on May 1st, and we rolled the rye and planted soybean. And so we had four termination, four termination dates, uh, also 10 days apart, ranging from, from May 1st to, to May 30th, uh, and basically looked at uh, you know how effectively could we could we kill the rye? And so this is a figure uh, on the the y-axis. So on the left-hand side, you see rye control percent rye control from zero to 100 percent, and then along the bottom are those dates that we came in and we rolled it May 1st to, to May 30th, and then the different colored bars are the planting dates in the fall, from August 25th to uh, uh, to October 15th. Uh, and basically what you see from that May 1st rolling date was that we didn't kill any of it, no matter what date we planted it, that we didn't achieve more than about 25% control, so the rye grew back and, and would have been a problem uh, for the soybean crop. On the other hand, if we waited 10 days uh, and rolled it on May 10th, or 20 days on May 20th, or a month later on May 30th, you can see that rapidly we achieved uh, pretty good control. And so actually by the May 30th date, it didn't matter what date we planted it in the fall, uh, we killed it um, with all those different, with the, at all those dates. And sort of to boil this down, uh, here we have a little, a little table, again, on the left-hand side of those dates that we planted in the fall, August 25th through October 15th, and along the top, May 1st to, to May 30th. Uh, and what you see is the, the, the blue highlighted areas, those are percent controls. And so uh, only one of those dates on May 10th did we successfully kill the rye, 89% control when it was planted on the 25th of August. However, by the, the 20th of May, we were successful for three of those planting dates. And again, by the 30th of May, it really didn't matter when we planted it in the fall because we could kill it uh, regardless. And what this all comes down to is really the, the growth stage of the rye. And so uh, obviously at each of those dates, uh, we characterized how far along the rye was. Uh, and you can see along the bottom, uh, tillering, boot stage, flowering, hard dough stage. Uh, and again, cereal rye control uh, on the left-hand side of the graph. And we sort of are using this 85% as our effective control 
We know that if we can achieve 85%, that, that that's going to be good enough to not compete with our crop. Uh, less than 85%, we might be somewhat concerned uh, that we would compete with the, with the cash crop, in this case, soybeans. So you can see that really that flowering and that anthesis state uh, was when we uh, were successful. And what really what this means is you start to see uh, you know, those anthers, uh, the male flowers are visible uh, on, those, on those heads. And, uh, and we were quite consistent. And we, we tested this on actually two different rye cultivars uh, over a two-year period. You might look at this graph that, that uh, some folks use. It's a, a Zadox scale. Uh, some folks use a Feek scale. And it's somewhere between 55 and 60 is, is uh, sort of what we're saying, Zadok stage 55 or 60, which actually equates to a, a FIC scale of 10.51. 10 so we did something very similar with, uh, with Harry Vetch, uh, although maybe not as, as detailed. Um, we were interested in, in, in when we could kill Harry Vetch in the spring. You don't have the flexibility in terms of, uh, of rolling date in the fall. Um, so we came in and we, uh, we looked at the hairy vetch and, you know, you can do a number of things. We knew that it probably needed to be reproductive. In fact, if you go back to that um, managing cover crops profitably quote, uh, which said uh, once vetch starts to bloom, it is easily killed by any mechanical treatment. Um, you can see here estimated 30% flowering, 75% flowering. So we did some, some rolling and discovered that, that, that actually that was not true, that it needed to be fairly far along uh, in the flowering stage. And this just shows, uh, again, percent control uh, from 50 to 100 percent. And then we rolled it at four different dates over a two-year period, the end of May, which is typically about the time we can start to get successful control here in the central part of Pennsylvania uh, up until the, the middle or even the third week of June. And so you see that percent control going up as we delay the, the rolling date. Um, we had a student, uh, Ruth Mishler, who uh, is part of her thesis, her master's degree. Uh, characterized hairy vetch growth stage based on the uh, the upper five nodes or branches of the vine, and this is sort of the method that we ended up using, where you're looking at those those top five branches on the top of the, uh, at the uh, terminal of the vetch plant, uh, and you're looking for the presence of flowers and or small pods. And so the way she uh, characterized it, uh, one was no flower buds present, which you see on the left hand side. Uh, Seven is uh, early pod set. You can see uh, one to two uh, pods, and then late pod set, or nine, which was four, four plus pods. And basically what we concluded there was we could get consistent control uh, by, by stage seven, uh, although you know six to eight was, was fine. So consistent control with the roller crimper. Once we, we uh, saw the beginning of, of early pods on that, that, those upper five, five uh, nodes. And you can see that there's a publication in the Agronomy Journal there that uh, uh, it, you can write that down if you'd like more information uh, on what we, we found in that particular experiment. So just to sort of bring my point to the end, some finer points uh, that I wanted to make sure you, you are aware of. These are sort of the details, a couple of details that often are, are left out. Um, what we're talking about here today is, is uh, rolling crimping cover crops. And all of our evaluations uh, include planting. And so uh, you see the, the picture on the, on the right is roll and plant uh, versus the, the roll only on the left. And what we have found is that the, the combination, the roll and plant, is really, really critical. And so those, those percent control values that, that I'm giving you uh, thus far, that includes rolling and planting. Uh, the actual action of driving over that cover crop with a planter or with a drill <coughs> uh, with, with more tires uh, actually helps aid the control of that cover. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. The other thing that sometimes uh, is lost in the shuffle is that um, the direction that you plant the, the rye, in this case we're talking about rye, or at least a cereal grain, that you plant the, the rye and the direction that you roll, um, actually it's better to have them different. And so the, the, the picture up in the left hand uh, part of the slide is, is, and that actually is wheat, it says rye, but it's wheat rolled the same direction that it was planted. So the, the wheat was planted in the fall and then it was rolled in the spring, the same direction. And what you see there is, is gaps. And that's because those rows are, are remaining intact versus the lower right-hand corner, which is rye that was rolled per perpendicular to the direction that it was seeded. Now, you always plant the cash crop the same direction that you roll. But if you can offset the direction that you plant the cover crop, 
in the direction that you roll a little bit. It doesn't need to be perpendicular in this case. Uh, it could be just you know 15 or 20 degrees. You'll achieve a, a better, more uniform cover uh, that will be more weed suppressive. So to sort of to bring my point to the end here, uh, basically uh, mechanical control of of raw increased with earlier planting dates and later kill dates, as you saw. Uh, the planting date becomes increasingly less critical for mechanical control the later you you uh, you want to roll it in the spring. So really, if you can if you can delay planting in the spring, planting date in the fall is less critical. And this is this is for rye or for for other cereals. Uh, we typically we're looking at that 85% uh, as being effective, 85% or greater. And we saw that that was true when rye was flowering. Zadok 60 or Fleex 10.51. And then consistent hairy vets control was achieved with rolling when small pods were observed on the top five nodes of the plant. So with that, uh, I'd like to give the control to Stephen and uh, let him uh, take it from here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, Bill did a really nice job at uh, highlighting uh, uh, the, the journey we've taken thus far and, 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 and some of the uh, um, developments related to the management of the cover crops and, and the specific cover crops uh, we've been targeting uh, for in the corn and, and soybean system. And so I'm going to now uh, uh, have you take a look a little bit at some of the yields that we've gotten in, in these uh, uh, systems and the factors that are driving the performance of those yields and, and, and how we've been trying to influence that performance and its consistency. So here you can see a collection of, of corn yields uh, in the top right here and soybean yields in the bottom left. And you can see this, this, uh, these pictures highlighting the rolled vetch system that corn would be planted into and the rolled rye here that the uh, soybean would be planted into. And so these yields are across uh, three different sites. That's uh, the Beltsville Agricultural Research uh, Center in Maryland, where I'm working, uh, Penn State uh, University and the Rodale Institute. And the yields that you're seeing here reflect a number of experiments that have been pooled together. And so there are the averages of these experiments. And many of these experiments are, are meant to uh, look at uh, a range of types of practices that will improve the performance of the crops. So some of our, our, our yields are a little higher. Some of our yields are a little lower. And so this reflects that those mean yields and as well as the variation in yields uh, at the sites uh, for the different uh, crops. And I, I think that the main take-home message uh, from this slide is, is that, that we are able to achieve pretty uh, uh, adequate yields in these uh, uh, grain systems, uh, but the yields are quite variable. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, inconsistency from year to year and, and with the success of various management strategies. So the remainder of, of what I'll be talking about is, is, is how we've tried to approach dealing with these, uh, these, this, this lack of consistency in the performance of the, of the crop. And so here are the, the primary factors that, that we've been uh, looking at. And these are not uh, factors that are new to any type of uh, cropping system. Uh, but the, the, it becomes even more challenging in a, a reduced tillage grain production system when you start to remove a lot of the primary uh, management pr uh, uh, tactics, particularly in the case of weeds. So th this schematic is going to be an overview of, of kind of a, a grain system. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about the rye soybean, but this same schematic applies to the, the rye soybean and the uh, vetch corn system, obviously with some, some variations. But so here are our primary factors affecting yields is our weeds, uh, soil moisture, crop population, and soil fertility. And these will directly affect yields as well as uh, have some interactions. So fertility can affect the performance of the weeds. Uh, crop population certainly can also affect uh, weed performance and other indirect effects on, on soil moisture. So cover crops have been the primary uh, tool that we've targeted as uh, how to manipulate um, these factors and improve their overall performance. So this comes with looking at a range of different agronomic strategies of how to manipulate the performance of the cover crop. So we've looked at seeding rates and planting dates and termination dates, as well as uh, equipment, which uh, directly is affected by also the uh, cover crop biomass levels. 
And these arrows are not necessarily to always reflect a positive effect. So some of these uh, uh, arrows uh, uh, denote an a, a antagonistic effect of a, of a given factor. Uh, and we've also looked at uh, other strategies for uh, managing weeds uh, directly through high residue cultivation. Uh, we've looked at this across a range of sea bank levels. Uh, and, and there are species-specific responses. Additionally, uh, insects. Uh, are uh, an important component of this system uh, that when you have these high residue environments directly affecting crop population and uh, ways to manipulate the performance of the system as well through uh, soil fertility management can either directly affect weeds through uh, re uh, immobilizing nitrogen in the case of the, the rye soybean system uh, or are making sure adequate fertility is available in the case of a vetch corn. And I think that the, the, the main point of, of the schematic is not so much to, to focus on individual pathways, but to realize the, the complexity of the system and the push-pull relationships with, with this management, that, that some management practices improve, improve the performance of one factor, but can also have an antagonistic effect on another. And, and so the remainder of my talk will target uh, some of the uh, factors we've been looking at. Uh, certainly can't cover uh, the whole uh, gamut of, of factors here. So our early focus was on weed suppression, because as you remove uh, the, the primary control tactics, uh, such as herbicides and um, uh, tillage and cultivation in these reduced tillage grain systems, uh, weeds are, are, are a primary uh, management constraint. And so a lot of the early focus even went back as far as the, the early 90s uh, with uh, Chuck Muller and, and John Teasdale's work characterizing the suppressive nature of mulches here. Particularly, we're looking at a rye mulch and what kinds of biomass levels are necessary to suppress those weeds. And you can see here on this x-axis here, this is the, the range of rye uh, mulch. And here are weed seedling densities on the y-axis. And the highlighted area shows kind of the range in mulch where you start to get that persistent uh, suppression of the weeds, uh, particularly in the case of the, the summer annuals. And so around 7,500 to 8,000 uh, pounds per acre of biomass has been, has been shown to be effective at, at having a fairly uh, significant and persistent uh, weed suppression. Um, so because cover crop mulches are so important for the, the, the performance of, of the, of the uh, system and, and to reduce the weeds. Uh, we've looked a lot at different ways to uh, enhance the performance of the cover crop and just characterize the general potential of a cover crop uh, in, in these systems. And so here um, you can see a range of, of growth and development of the rye from all the way from early August 25th to October 15th. Uh, this is work that was uh, done at Penn State University that uh, Bill uh, highlighted earlier. And so you can see here in the spring the, the wide range in, in ground cover and growth of, of these cover crops as a function of when they were planted. And this can translate uh, directly into uh, uh, differences in biomass production. So looking at here this x-axis across these planting dates here, you can see uh, uh, an increase in overall 2,000 pounds per acre of, of Zero rye biomass across that, that gradient of planting dates. Now, however, if we look at uh, a 10 day delay in the spring, we get a much bigger uh, uh, increase in the overall biomass uh, compared to the fall. So, while the fall is an important uh, factor in, in driving uh, the zero rye biomass performance, uh, just a, a shorter delay, uh, for example, here we're showing about one spring day approximately equal six fall days, uh, can, can quickly pick up that difference in that 2,000 uh, pounds per acre of rye biomass. Now, in the case of hairy vetch, hairy vetch ha doesn't have the same level of, of flexibility as, as rye. So hairy vetch uh, really needs to be planted to turn an optimal range in, in the fall. Uh, and this will certainly vary uh, regionally. Uh, but it's, it's a lot more vulnerable to uh, winter kill. And, and so it, the window of opportunity of planting is a little bit tighter, and so it's not a, as much of an option for management. Now, termination date is also a little bit less flexible uh, because it has a smaller window of time when you can control it. 
And so the, 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 it's not as much of an option, a management option, but there is some flexibility in the spring at least um, that you might be able to offset some of those time of, of planting in, in uh, response to the types of weeds you have in your system. In the case of uh, rye, uh, we've looked at a number of other sh uh, strategies beyond just planting and termination dates. Uh, row spacing uh, can have uh, an influence on the uh, early ground cover and performance uh, of, of the mulch as a weed suppressive tool. And some work that uh, uh, Rodale just recently uh, uh, did uh, where they were looking at broadcast seeding 50% uh, uh, of the cereal rye, and then drilling into that cereal, uh, that, that broadcasted uh, field, uh, result in a really nice ground cover and a uniform rye uh, population across the soil uh, surface, which may act as a, a greater weed suppressive uh, tool. Where we haven't looked at that as closely just yet, but uh, it seems to really create a nice cover. Soil fertility is also an important factor in the overall performance of cereal rye and its weed suppressive potential. So here is a, is a cereal rye uh, cover crop, and you can see quite clearly that there's a, lo a lot of light coming in uh, from the top of the canopy uh, to the soil surface where weeds are emerging and are going to be a problem in that rolled system because the roller doesn't really kill a lot of these weeds. So it's, it's critical to get a early cover and uh, a heaviest cover as possible to suppress any weeds prior to rolling. And, and having adequate fertility levels is critical to achieve these goals. So we have some early work that, uh, that we're doing here at uh, BARC, but, but it's also being uh, replicated at uh, Penn State and uh, North Carolina uh, State University. Um, and just to give you a, a, a little bit of details on this. If there's more interest in this work, feel free to, to contact us. Uh, but we're trying to characterize the, uh, the relationship between tiller density and uh, nitrogen availability and stress. And we've seen some uh, nice responses of, of tiller density to uh, fertility levels and associated that with uh, cereal rye biomass. And there's clearly a, a strong relationship between uh, tiller density and cover crop biomass. And so part of this work is trying to come up with thresholds for uh, fertility levels and, and, and early metrics like tiller density uh, to determine whether or not the cereal rye uh, stand that you have will be an adequate uh, weed suppressive mulch. To get these adequate uh, cover crop stands, it's important to uh, use uh, uh, cover, uh, standard uh, drills or no-till drills for seeding these covers. Um, we targeted high seeding rates uh, uh, in order to get optimal uh, stands and, and, and populations. And this is uh, uh, these are used in till and no-till uh, environments prior to uh, seeding of the cover crop. But as we push these, these systems to have the highest levels of biomass we can achieve in order to get the kinds of adequate weed suppression uh, necessary for the success of the, the uh, crop yields, um, we start to introduce new challenges. And so getting the kinds of equipment through these residues have been quite difficult. Uh, um, early on, we did work with drills, but we've had a hard time getting consistent uh, uh, soybean populations with uh, grain drills. We find the, the planters to be more consistent and effective at getting through these mulches. Um, we've also, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, looked at a range of seeding rates, and, and, and it, it, it's definitely advisable in the case of soybeans to get those populations uh, higher. It can act as a, a supplementary uh, weed control, particularly if the rye biomass levels are a little lower. Um, and we've looked at a range of these types of equipment here. You can see here with these closing wheels and, and trash wheels for getting optimal uh, uh, cover crop, uh, uh, I mean seed uh, to soil contact. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge in these systems, and it's important to identify uh, when you're trying to uh, do this reduced tillage uh, production practice that you have the types of equipment that can get through these heavy residues. Uh, even still, uh, with, with all these uh, approaches that we've taken to optimize uh, cover crop uh, mulch biomass, um, we, Consistent weed control uh, does not occur, and, and, and so it's quite system-specific. Uh, for example, 
Um, some species are, are, are more effectively suppressed than others. Um, the, the size of the weed seed bank can really influence the success. So a very high density weed seed bank uh, can, can, can be difficult to suppress even with uh, high levels of mulch. Perennial weeds are, are largely unaffected by uh, uh, mulch levels. So they have a, a very uh, strong reserve uh, in, in their rooting system, which uh, prohibits uh, uh, the mulch from suppressing them. And you can see here in these pictures these, the types of rooting depths that some of these perennials can have and, and the intricacy of their, their root systems. They have these reserves that make it very difficult to suppress uh, perennials uh, with a mulch. And so we wanted to look at uh, various supplementary control tactics in the case of where uh, the perennials are, are becoming an evident problem. And so we've worked some with these high residue cultivators, uh, as you can see here in the pictures. Uh, off to the right here, this, uh, is, the, this is a John Deere uh, unit that's uh, no longer in production uh, that Penn State has been using. Uh, we've been using a, a souk up here uh, that you can see uh, in this picture. And these units uh, come in and, and um, cut a slit through the residue and, and undercut the weeds uh, below the cover crop uh, mulch. And I'll talk more specifically about the unit, but you can see here we have seen uh, advantages to using this here is the high residue cultivation that's gone through the field uh, two times and, and this yield potential in soybeans. Uh, this is a single post roundup application uh, in, in, this, in the same field. And here is the yields from no management. And the, the resulting difference between these are largely attributed to differences in weed biomass. So here's uh, the uh, high residue cultivator going through a heavy field of, of rye. And essentially, they have uh, this, this uh, straight coulter that goes in, in front of the sweep. And this coulter cuts that path right here, as you can see. And then these sweeps have this thin shank and that, that uh, slices through the residue where that slit was. And then these wide sweeps come underneath and just clip the weeds uh, at the soil surface. And here is an example of having some efficacy also on perennials. Another important uh, component of, of managing weeds in the system is, is to look at the integration of these tactics and identify where we can uh, get a synergy between these tactics to suppress the weeds. Because in the end, um, many of these tactics have had different levels of success at weed management. But at these high seed bank densities or in the face of perennials, it's still a challenge to get consistent suppression. So we've been targeting, looking at how we can combine tactics and quantify uh, their interactions. And so this is just a simple example of that. Here you have rye mulch on your x-axis, and here's wheat biomass. And in the absence of soybeans, um, uh, across this cereal rye mulch gradient, you can see it all the way up to 9,000 is what it took to get below this 2,000 uh, pounds per acre threshold of wheat biomass, which uh, you know, you'd like to be below 1,000, but 2,000 is where you really start to get significant effects on, on, on crop yield. Uh, but just the uh, introduction of, of, a, of a soybean crop uh, uh, can reduce the performance of uh, the weeds, and uh, even higher densities of those soybeans uh, can get even greater uh, decrease in weed suppression. So the combination of, of mulch and soybean densities can compensate some, so in, in fields where uh, rye mulch levels might not be as high, increasing the seeding rate has, has been shown to be an effective way of, of complementing uh, the system to still get adequate yields. So you've looked, we've talked a lot about the different components of, of, of some of these systems and, and, uh, and how we've tried to target uh, manipulating them to improve the performance. Uh, some of our recent work is trying to integrate uh, these practices into a single crop rotation and use different timing in the crop rotation to manage the weeds. And so one, by uh, delaying the timing of the planting of a cash crop can serve as, as, a, as a weed uh, suppressive uh, mechanism. Uh, supplemental control with cultivation also has a, a degree of efficacy. And here, um, expressive stale seed bedding uh, during periods of time in the rotation where there isn't a cover growing that you can express those weed seeds that are in the soil surface, all act as, as, as uh, 
tactics to drive down the weed population uh, when you're not growing the cash crop as well as within the cash crop to try to get optimal management. And so we'll have more reporting on, on this work in, in the future. Uh, just to highlight a few additional constraints and challenges uh, within uh, this system. So we, we talked uh, a, a bit about uh, the, the need to push the, the mulch levels uh, higher to get uh, adequate feed suppression. Uh, this comes as a challenge, uh, particularly in the case of, of insects, uh, because it creates this cool, moist environment. It's an optimal habitat for many uh, uh, insect pests. And so you can see by some of these results uh, here, uh, based on the timing in which we planted our crop and, and killed uh, the cover crop, we had varying degrees of, of corn population, as indicated by this red line. And um, that also follows and tracks closely with the yield of a cash crop. And some of the entomologists involved in this project uh, were documenting the cutworms and wireworms and their contributions. Uh, to uh, those uh, changes in, in population. This has been a real uh, challenge uh, and, and something that we're following up on, but we don't have a, a lot of uh, uh, results to report uh, yet. Finally, uh, we've talked a lot about the role of hairy vetch as a, as a cover crop and its performance uh, and, and a lot of the benefits of hairy vetch. But here on the East Coast, for example, um, there's a, a lot of uh, skepticism about the use of hairy vetch in uh, crop rotation, particularly by growers who uh, have wheat in their rotation. Uh, and their concern is that hairy vetch will be a weed on their farm. And so by and large, uh, most of the growers that we work with on the East Coast um, are, are, not, are not interested in using hairy vetch in their system, and they're concerned about it become a persistent weed. And so we have some uh, work uh, that's trying to target uh, specifically hairy vetch persistence and its longevity uh, uh, over time in the soil. And here's a, a project by Ben Crockett, a graduate student that's working with Bill Curran and I, where he's characterizing the long-term persistence of hairy vetch uh, seed banks um, and different types of strategies for scarifying those seeds to try to reduce its overall persistence and, and its problem within the crop rotation. So some of the key points that I uh, was targeting was uh, that we, we have seen some good uh, yields. Uh, the potential is there, but the consistency uh, needs improvement. And, and you, you can see by our talk some of the strategies we've taken to, to work on that. Uh, cover crop management is key for adequate weed suppression. We really need to consider our cover crop uh, to be as sensitive as a cash crop and, and manage it thus to get the kinds of performance that we're targeting. Um, we're suggesting 7,500 pounds per acre as, as kind of a threshold uh, in cover crop biomass that, that we're targeting to get there or above to get the kind of adequate weed suppression uh, we need from a mulch. Uh, this is certainly challenged by perennials, as mentioned before. Uh, it's important to identify the types of uh, equipment, uh, specialized equipment that can go through these residues and get the kind of penetration through the cover crop to get adequate. Uh, seed to soil contact of the cash crop. And uh, the supplementary weed control tools uh, are still uh, being explored. Uh, we've had some levels of success with these high residue cultivators, but uh, um, they can also be a challenge to, to get into the field depending on soil type. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the ability to reduce tillage in these organic production really rely on an interaction of these tactics to get the kind of synergy needed uh, for optimal weed control. And I think that's an important part of, of, of getting the system to work. Uh, future research efforts, I mentioned uh, this long-term cropping systems experiment that uh, we just initiated to look at the uh, interaction between uh, uh, the, the crops in the rotation and the ability to get these crops into a rotation uh, uh, in a timely fashion to support uh, getting the cover crops planted in a timely fashion and get the kinds of services that we need from that cover crop. So while we've had a lot of success with uh, management uh, in individual cash crops, uh, we have yet to test this within a rotation. And so we have some nice work uh, coming out from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware on that. And finally, I wanted to uh, highlight a direction that we're going um, with a collaborator uh, at ARS Auburn, uh, Alabama, Tom Way, uh, trying to uh, get away from these pure vetch 
cover crops because they tend not to be as weed suppressive as you move further south because they decompose so rapidly and uh, work more closely with mixtures that have a higher proportion of grasses, which can challenge uh, the uh, overall nitrogen availability for the cash crop. And so we've been working with this group in Auburn who are developing uh, poultry litter injectors and trying to inject uh, uh, poultry litter to supplement the fertility uh, for the corn crop. So with that, I'm going to hand uh, the talk over to uh, Bill. Okay, Steve, thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody. I am Bill Mason. Uh, we live in Queens County, Maryland, on Eastern Shore. Fourth generation farmers. Uh, we do have about 850 acres that we till. Uh, about five or six years ago, we decided that the uh, organic uh, market uh, was uh, calling us, and we decided to uh, transition uh, 190 acres on our home farm. And also that year, we rented 150 acres that was already certified organic. Um, today we have 500 acres altogether that's certified organic. We also have 40 acres that are in transition. Um, our no-till experience has been mostly with soybeans, rolled soybeans with rye cover crop. Uh, we did participate with uh, Rodale and Penn State several years ago and uh, for, for two years in several test plots on our farm. Uh, concerning cover crops and no-till soybeans and no-till corn. Um, Steve, you want to move that page, please? There we go. Um, as I said, uh, uh, we have been in the farming business for numerous years. I started farming with my dad in 1970. We uh, grew quite a few vegetables for a local cannery uh, for 30 years, uh, peas, lima beans, and string beans. Um, we were also in the custom combining business. Uh, then we got into the produce business on our farm. We have a produce market on our farm now. Um, we grow between 10 and 15 acres of vegetables every year. Uh, early, I guess, in uh, 2002, perhaps, I think, was uh, we had a, a pretty severe drought in this area. 2004, it was extremely wet in this area. And uh, with those several years there of tough, tough, being tough in the farming business, we decided to look for other avenues um, for this farm. And we started to research different crops or enterprises that may go along with uh, what we had here. Uh, we did become interested in the organic field. We had a neighbor that was doing some organic farming, and we talked to him. We also made several visits, visits to Rodale uh, Institute, talked to Jeff Moyer several times. Um, and I guess in 2005, we decided that uh, it was a good time to make the switch. Um, we have been growing mostly soybeans, corn, and barley, uh, organic crops. Uh, we do have a local organic dairy, uh, Horizon, which is about 25 miles from us and which uh, is a good market outlet for uh, organic crops. We also sell uh, some of our products in Pennsylvania and in New York. Um, as I said, uh, the first year we uh, started organic farming, uh, 2005, uh, we had uh, all the necessary equipment. Uh, we had been in the vegetable business, as I said, for quite a few years. Uh, we had the plows and the cultivators and the rotary hose, and uh, we knew how to handle those pieces of equipment. So the organic, uh, switching to organic wasn't a big cost factor or, or a big switch for us, it would just be planting uh, crops without the use of fertilizer and chemicals. Uh, after the first year though, I think we, uh, with the 150 we rented in our 190, we went over 340 acres about eight or nine times and uh, at the conclusion of that year I decided that uh, it would be uh, 
interesting to look into this no-till a little more seriously. We had been to Rodale several times. I think we went back to Rodale again and talked to Jeff and looked at some of their uh, no-till seedings up there. And uh, that fall decided that uh, we would plant some more rye and try the no-till uh, planting of soybeans the following year. Um, the, um, we also bought a roller uh, from I&J Manufacturing in Pennsylvania, uh, a 15-foot wide roller. We had a 15-foot wide no-till drill, and we thought that would be the easiest thing for us to do. Uh, we seeded our rye uh, that fall, uh, about the 1st of October, uh, and proceeded the next spring uh, around the uh, 18th of May, uh, seeding our first no-till soybean crop. We did seed our we have seeded most of our all of our um, soybean crops in the rye as their population around 200,000 plants per acre. Um, the first first year was probably our most successful. Uh, we had a yield of 55 bushels an acre. Um, the wheat pressure was very low. Uh, the next two preceding years, 2007, 2008, we continued with the same program. We planted rye, rolled, uh, planted soybeans the following spring, and those next two years, our yields were in the 46 to 47 bushel bracket for soybeans, which was uh, quite acceptable to us, uh, uh, figuring that we saved a fair amount of time, labor, effort, and money by rolling versus um, um, uh, plowing. Um, the uh, the following year, 2009, uh, was our uh, unsuccessful year in the rolling business. We had planted a cover crop. We had planted our soybeans in the spring. Um, same procedure that we had been using, but we had several um, uh, heavy rains after planting it at that at that time. And uh, our, our soybean emergence was poor, but our wheat emergence was great. Uh, after doing many uh, seed and weed counts, uh, we determined we had many more weeds than we had soybeans coming up. And so we plowed, uh, plowed that field uh, around the 1st of July and replanted the beans. Um, the, uh, last year was the first year that we had it enrolled any crops because um, we couldn't get our rye cover crop in the uh, preceding fall in on time. We had to fly it all with an airplane. Uh, one thing that you, well, we decided wouldn't work is trying to roll a crop down that's in a, in a cultivated cornfield just be simply because the roller would not uh, hit the ground evenly and would not do a good job of killing the plants. Also, the drill would not probably not do as, uh, nearly as good a job. Uh, planting in um, the hilled rows as versus on a flat surface. Um, our experience in the in the uh, soybean, rolling the soybeans with the rye has been uh, pretty good. We're, we're well satisfied with uh, what we've done so far. We still have uh, some uh, points to learn, as uh, Steve pointed out. Uh, some good points were about getting your cover crop in at a proper time, at a proper seeding rate, and, and having the much needed biomass in the spring to suppress the weeds. Um, another uh, venture that we uh, got into for several years with Rodale and Penn State, uh, they did come down here in 2006 and 2007, and um, we did have several test plots with them. Um, we they planted the cover crops in the fall for no-till planting of corn and no-till planting of soybeans in the spring. Uh, the first year we used uh, clover and wheat and planted uh, corn in that. Uh, we also did some uh, um, uh, rye. They also planted some rye. We rolled soybeans in that. The thing that we learned about uh, these experiments was mostly uh, planting the no-till corn. Um, we had uh, very limited success doing that. As Steve said, the uh, insect pressure, uh, I think because of the rolled clover, uh, created an ideal seedbed for some insects. Uh, 
I didn't have the planer properly adjusted because of the mat of uh, biomass on there. Uh, the cover crop was uneven. There was a whole host of problems that we had the first year, uh, and our harvest result was very poor. Uh, I think we harvested in the 40 to 50 bushels of corn range. And uh, compared to uh, the, the whole field, I think the whole field was an approximately 140 bushel range where we had uh, plowed the cover crop down and planted the corn. Uh, the second year we uh, had the experiment with Rodale and Penn State. Uh, we both planted Austrian winter peas in that and um, uh, mixed in with barley. I think we have a picture of that, don't we, Steve? Yeah, that right there. Uh, the peas and the barley and the crimson clover and the barley, we had several test plots of that and uh, unfortunately uh, we met with the same results we, we had the year before. Uh, we did have the corn planter adjusted a little better that year, but still found, I think because of insect pressure and also uh, nitrogen issue, uh, we still, I think, harvested corn in the 50 bushel range with the rest of the field in the 140 bushel range. Um, air, uh, my uh, synopsis of the two years of no-till corn is uh, uh, it certainly hasn't worked very well for us. We haven't used the vetch. Uh, we're reluctant to use that. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's some potential there and we're anxious to try that also again in the future. Um, the um, Okay, hey Bill. This is this is Bill. I'm gonna. Uh, we need to uh, bring this to the end so they have some time for, for some questions. Maybe just to quickly just tell uh, okay. tell the group um, where where you're headed now. What are you thinking? Well, we're thinking that we're, we're we do have 275 acres of rye in that we planted last fall. We are anxious to try to roll again this year. Uh, last year being the one out of five that we didn't. Uh, we are proceeding down that road. We think that we can try to get a handle on the uh, biomass and the good cover crop. And I think the the, uh, the uh, rolling of the soybeans works very well, or has worked pretty well for us. And, and we are definitely going down that road uh, uh, for time savings and labor and everything else. The the corn we're still interested in that, but uh, uh, I think we're going to let you guys work on that before we try it again. Okay, uh, Alice, you want to uh, take it from here? Yeah, um, thank you, Bill, Stephen, and Bill. Um, we're about to start our question and answer period. Um, and for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, you can just use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. If you don't see that question box, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. Um, our pre presentation ran a bit long, so we're going to spend an extra five or ten minutes or so with the question and answers um, to get as many people as possible with their questions answered. We'll read them out loud. Um, before we start our question and answer, we're going to spend about one minute um, just launching a couple of quick poll questions. The presenters would really appreciate it if you could just quickly vote on those to just kind of rate your knowledge of no-till before and after this webinar. Um, so if you could just quickly vote on that, we'll have that up for about 20 seconds or so, and then we'll get on to the next one. We've got four in total, but it really shouldn't take more than a minute, and then Anybody who has questions can just type them in. We've got some already. Okay, we could move on to the next one. Okay, please rate your knowledge of no-till now after today's webinar. Okay, now if we could move on to the last two questions. As a result of today's presentation, do you plan to try organic no-till in your work or on your farm? Um, already doing, plan to do it, do not plan to do it, or does not apply, perhaps you're not a farmer? Okay, then we'll move on to our final question which is, if you are a farmer, how many acres do you currently manage? Less than 50, 51 to 200, 201 to 500, more than 500, or not applicable? 
Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so um, the first few questions that we're getting refer to um, Stephen's experiments in Pennsylvania. Let's see if others could maybe mute themselves a little bit. I'm getting a lot of feedback echoing. Um, so if you want to answer this question, you can unmute yourself. Let's see how this goes. Um, we had a question I wanted to know whether you have down pressure on the roller. Is the roller filled with water for weight? Anybody want to take that question? So, so yeah, I'll, I'll uh, field that. So the, the roller, um, <laughs> there's some, some feedback going on back there. Um, we are filling the roller, if it's the Rodale style roller, the one that uh, uh, INJ manufactures, um, which they come from you know, 5 to 15 feet uh, in length. Um, they're about um, uh, 1,200 pounds empty. Uh, and when you fill them with water, uh, you bring that up to about 2,000 pounds. Um, Bill can comment uh, on what he does with his 15-foot roller, but, but uh, the one that we have at Penn State is actually a wider diameter um, steel, and so actually it's it, it, empty. It weighs about 3,000 pounds. Um, basically, when you run it, you have your uh, you have the uh, uh, the um, three-point hitch in in uh, float mode, so you know you're not really adding any uh, additional down pressure. Bill, do you want to comment on that? Uh, I agree with you. We do fill air 15 foot with water. I'm not exactly sure how much it weighs, but I think it's uh, at least 3,000 pounds. And we also run. We have a front three point hitch, and we run that in the uh, in the float position also. Okay. Um, let's see. Next question. How does um, let's see. How does an 85 percent control um, this refer to um, the uh, experiment in Penn State on rye, um, how does 85 percent control compare to the results you might get using chemical methods of control? Um, so, so typically with, with, uh, if you're using herbicides for control, um, you know, you would be 90 percent or better, um, otherwise you're not choosing the right herbicide. <laughs> so so uh, typically uh, 85 percent um, or better would be considered um, you know, effective control. Oftentimes we'll use a similar sort of rating system for weeds, uh, that if you're getting, you know, 85% or better control of the weeds, uh, then they're not going to be competitive. 100% would be, you know, complete control. Zero would be no control. Okay. Um, here's a question for Bill. Um, have you had any hairy vetch volunteer the year after rolling and crimping at early or mid pod set? Um, yeah, that's one of those those finer points that I probably could have added to the slide. Um, so um, one of the issues that you will have in this rolled system with hairy vetch is that you will have hairy vetch going to seed um, when you roll when you roll it. Uh, really, no matter how late you roll it, um, you, you inevitably will have some go to seed, and so that is one of the the concerns that we have, particularly if you have small grains uh, in the rotation. Uh, interestingly. Uh, some of the work that, that actually Stephen has been involved with at the USDA, um, where they're on a longer term rotation, they're, they are using uh, uh, tillage in that system. Uh, they're not seeing volunteer hairy vetch problems in other crops, but something that we're going to investigate a little bit more, how long you need to stay out of uh, a susceptible crop like, uh, like wheat, winter wheat, if you, if you were to have vetch go to seed. Um, so that, that can be a concern and that's something people need to keep in mind. Okay. Um, oh, I just wanted to mention also that this webinar has been recorded, um, if you missed the beginning of the presentation, and it will be posted within the coming week on our website under archived webinars on the eOrganic website. And if after the webinar you have additional questions, you're welcome to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask, and you'll get an answer. And finally, we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email today. So let me just move on with more questions. Um, why do denser soybean populations have a positive effect on weed control? Is it the shading? Stephen, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so increasing the soybean population uh, density, uh, for one, will increase the, the density of, of plants growing in the row. And, and so uh, one of the main problems in this system is weeds that are emerging in the row because we're coming in with a planter and disturbing the soil slightly, uh, uh, pushing seed through that mulch. And so that particular zone is a little bit more vulnerable, per se, 
uh, then the uh, between the row, uh, if particularly if you have a high level of residue and you're getting adequate uh, sweat suppression between the row. So for one, it increases the, the number of uh, plants that are physically uh, growing and shading uh, uh, seeds that might be merging uh, in the row, but then also increasing uh, your population can, can ensure that you're uh, getting uh, faster canopy closure and, and suppressing the weeds uh, between the row. And, and, and also, because it's difficult getting uh, equipment through these heavy residues, it keep increasing the seeding rate also uh, as a little bit extra insurance to increase the chances that uh, the density is, is of plants are, are closely targeting what you're trying to uh, get in the field. Okay. Um, next question. How are you providing nitrogen fertilizer to the roll-down rye organic corn system? Okay, so one thing I um, want to be real clear about is that we're, we're not using rye with corn. Uh, we're only using rye with soybean. Uh, so we're using hairy vetch with corn. Uh, and we've looked at uh, other legumes also with corn. But, but you would not want to use rye, uh, rolled down rye with corn. Uh, I think that could really be disastrous. Uh, and as you suggest, the fertility uh, is one of the big issues. So you're going to need nitrogen, nitrogen fertility in particular that the, the rye is going to, going to take advantage of, uh, leaving the corn uh, without any. And then just there's issues uh, with big rye cover crops in corn uh, just don't get along. And so uh, you need to definitely choose the cover crop uh, and the cash crop uh, closely. They need to be aligned with one another uh, for the system to work well. Now, one thing we have done, uh, or that we're doing now, is we use uh, we have used rye with hairy vetch and rolled that. We've used triticale with hairy vetch and rolled that and planted corn into those systems. Uh, when we've done that, we have greatly reduced the amount of the cereal. Uh, so, for example, uh, in, a, in a current project that we have going, we're, we're planting, uh, we're seeding 30, 30 pounds of hairy vetch and 30 pounds of triticale or rye. Um, as opposed to in those in those monoculture systems, you would be using you know two to three bushels um, of uh, of rye or triticale, so a much reduced amount of the cereal. Okay, um, here's a question for Stephen Mursky. Um, you showed a table. Well, this is actually kind of a long question, two part. You showed a table of no-till organic corn yields, comparing average yields across multiple trials for three locations with comparisons to county averages. It looks like corn yields at PSU and Rodale are reduced by 40 to 45 percent. You say this shows the good yield potential of this method. What about the impact of late planted varieties in the roll down system and lack of nitrogen fertilizer? It's a good question. Um, so first let me highlight that the data that was presented represents a, a range of, of treatments and some of those treatments um, uh, did not perform well, and so it, it, it sh it, that, that's featured in, in the mean values that, that you see there, and, and some of the treatments uh, perform better. In the, in the case of uh, particularly Penn State, where that, those yields are, are, are fairly low uh, in, in corn, um, that particular uh, experiment uh, included uh, uh, late planting dates, and the corn uh, uh, did not reach maturity, and so the yields were reduced because it did not have uh, it didn't reach black layer by the time uh, uh, the, the season started to get really cold, and so it, it shut down and, and didn't produce the kinds of yields uh, being targeted. And, and so that highlights one of the challenges as you move further north. As, as you move further north, the, the maturity group uh, that you're working with and, and, and the duration of season becomes a real challenge. And in fact, uh, that's prompted some of our recent work uh, to focus uh, more on corn silage in the rotation as you move further uh, north, particularly in regions uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, dairy operations and, and there's a lot of uh, need for corn silage. But it is, it is a concern uh, and it is a challenge. And, and so some of our uh, future work is also looking at um, shorter season uh, maturity groups for corn uh, to see if, if uh, the system will work better with these uh, faster maturing varieties. So that can be a challenge. Okay. Um, has anyone tried no-till roller crimping with green beans? Um, I don't think uh, Stephen and I certainly haven't. I don't know if Bill is uh, involved with anybody that that he knows, uh, but I can see uh, I can see some potential there. I 
I mean, we have no-tilled green beans, uh, not into heavy residues. Either of you guys have any comments on that? Well, we, we don't have... Uh, I don't have any comments. I don't, I don't know anybody that does that. Yeah, I, I echo that statement. We, have, we haven't worked with that, although I know that uh, uh, one of the farmers we have a collaboration with on the Eastern Shore has been interested in in doing this exact work with green beans and, and, and is interested to test that success. So he has some confidence in it, but other than that, no, I have no experience. Okay, here's a question for Steve and Bill. How do you control the weeds that emerge in the slot where the cast crop is planted? So, so uh, the whole idea, when, when the system is working perfectly, you, you are not, you're trying not to disturb that uh, seed slit very much because the more disturbance you have, if you open up and remove the cover, the more weeds are going to come through there. So actually our approach has been to, um, to try not to, to move that residue away from the crop row uh, very much or as little as possible. So we're not using uh, trash wheels or other sites of uh, row cleaners uh, to remove that residue. Uh, invariably you get weeds in the row. That's the first place they come in, as, as Stephen mentioned. Uh, and we're not looking at anything that to selectively remove weeds within the row. Uh, some of the supplemental sorts of things that Stephen mentioned, um, the high residue cultivator, for example, that's obviously just a between row tool. Um, and so our, I think our goal is, is that we're getting good enough weed control uh, over, uh, you know, 80 percent of the, of the land area or 85% of the land area that, that the weeds that come up in the row are going to be few enough that they won't impact yield greatly. Just, just to add to that, uh, one of the, the classic principles in, in ecological based weed management is that a, one of your most important weed suppressive tools is a healthy growing cash crop. So part of the management uh, practices that go into uh, these production systems are targeting getting optimal stand establishment of your cash crop, getting it out of the ground as fast as possible, making sure those populations are high, and not hindering its growth potential so that it is acting as a weed suppressive tool in itself uh, early on and, and out uh, uh, growing the uh, weeds that are emerging because a lot of our small seeded weeds are, have a, a much less reserve than these big cash crop seeds they can come out of the ground a little bit faster. So creating that, that advantage is, 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 is important. And, and some of the work that we're looking at uh, in addition to that is trying to target how uh, we can influence uh, nitrogen availability uh, early on. So trying to have a minimal amount of N availability in these high rye uh, cover crop systems and then we're trying to get uh, more uh, grass in the legume system to reduce some of that, the leakiness of the nitrogen early on so that the, the weeds don't get that head start and the cash crop can, can get a competitive advantage. Okay, here's an insect management question. How do you plan to mitigate the insect challenges to the system? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, um, that, that is the focus of a, of a new project that we started, uh, that we'll be starting actually this summer. Um, some of the data that Stephen presented showed you some, some cutworm problems that we've had in corn. That's probably one of our, our bigger threats here. Uh, other threats would include things like slugs, um, wireworm, seed corn maggot. Those are the kinds of uh, insects that we, we, insect pests that we uh, could be dealing with in these systems. Uh, most of the focus on, on this new project actually is, is um, sort of looking at uh, the phenology of when we plant the crop, uh, the maturity of that crop, and, and how that sort of synchronizes with insect pest problems. So really the idea, I think, with a lot of this is, is uh, avoidance. In the case of cutworm, we know there's a, a period of time when cutworm is going to potentially be a problem. Uh, you plant early, you can avoid it. If you plant late, you can avoid it. And so we're trying to better characterize um, you know, some of those, those definitions uh, based on planting date, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think some of the other pests that I mentioned, the uh, seed corn maggot, uh, wireworm white grub, um, you know, those are things that we're, we're trying to, to identify and figure out how we can attack them. But one of the things that's clear is it's difficult to, you know, to have any sort of uh, re re remediation tactic in place for some of those insects, in, at least in an organic system. 
Okay. Um, what would be the ideal equipment to incorporate shallowly the rye cover crop seeds in the fall? This question is about broadcast rye. Okay, okay. So, so uh, broadcasting rye and then trying to uh, uh, shallowly incorporate them. Um, there are farmers that do that, uh, that will broadcast rye and then uh, use some sort of a, a cold emulture or, or packing wheels. You know, you'd want to have, you'd need to have a pretty fine seed bed uh, when you uh, broadcast the rye and then you'd come in there with some sort of, uh, yeah, cold emulture uh, with the, that it would have some sort of packing wheel. Uh, smooth that seed bed out. Um, I guess um, I think that that's going to be less consistent uh, than than certainly drilling the rye, um, where you're going to get a, a nice even population. Uh, Stephen mentioned one of the things that um, we started to do, and that's we actually broadcast half of it, and then we drill the the second half. Uh, and again, the idea here is that you're going to want a really nice, even, competitive cover crop to suppress weeds in the spring. I'm afraid that if you just relied on broadcast seeding, uh, you would end up with some gaps and some holes, uh, and you'd have weeds coming into those gaps and holes next spring. So, so I think uh, in the system that we're describing today, uh, you know, you're going to be treating. You need to treat that cover crop like you would an expensive cash crop, uh, and and make sure you get good populations and and you know get them in, get them in early and get them up and and uh, uh, do all you can to make it successful. Okay, we have time. For to add to that, um, the, the drill gets really nice seed to soil contact and so as Bill was saying, the populations are going to be, uh, can, can be potentially inconsistent, but getting that seed to soil contact also ensures a rapid uh, germination and emergence and, and since the, we've, we've shown that, that the biomass uh, production of these cover crops can be linked some to the timing of establishment, getting optimal germination and, and, and establishment as fast as possible in the fall, particularly uh, when it's challenging to get that cover crop in, um, is important for, for increasing the success of, of the overall uh, uh, soybean cash crop. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this is in response to an earlier answer. It says, okay, rye monoculture isn't suitable for corn and you need to add vetch to the mixture. This has been well documented in the literature for 20 years. But if you can't kill the vetch until it reaches an early pod set, this is mid-June. This is a late planting date for corn in the mid-Atlantic region. Does this imply that this system will always have less yield than till systems that allow planting in mid-May? Well, um, that's a that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I think I think it depends on where you are. So so we we uh, we're throwing some dates out. Um, the we've had more success um, controlling hairy vetch in a timely fashion as we move to our southern the southern part of the Mid Atlantic, and less as we move north. That's where you start running into that mid June time frame. Uh, whereas actually, as you get down into Maryland, uh, you're not delaying it necessarily that much, but one of the big questions we have is, is can we plant corn in, in early June anyway, and maybe into mid-June, uh, and can we use a, uh, you know, an 80 or 85 day uh, uh, hybrid uh, rather than 100 or 105 day that we might use, uh, or maybe even longer than that, and can we achieve you know, reasonable yields? Um, so I, I, think, I think there's trade-offs, and it's going to depend on the year. Uh, we did some variety tests this, this past summer, uh, and we're quite successful uh, planting the first of June uh, in State College, Pennsylvania, achieving achieving good yields. Happened to be a, a bit of an odd summer uh, in that we had a dry June, uh, and that hurt some of the earlier planted corn. Um, so it really depends on the year. But that's a that's a, a great question and something that we're you know trying to tackle. Um, yes, this is kind of a related question. Um, one, uh, one listener wanted to know what um, whether you what varieties of seeds you use, whether you use GMO varieties or traditional public varieties, if you could describe that a little bit. Well, um, in anything that uh, we have going now that is uh, either in transition to organic or is organic, uh, we of course use uh, organic certified seed, um, which is non-GMO, non-treated. Uh, in some of our earlier work uh, that was conducted on ground that was not certified, uh, that had various varieties on them. In some of the early work, we may have been using conventional varieties, but they were, man they were managed uh, organically. Uh, say in the work that we're doing now, uh, anything that um, is either in transition or is certified, uh, you know, we have to use uh, uh, organic varieties. And there are a number of uh, seed companies 
uh, that we've relied on uh, to provide us uh, those rides. Okay, this is the final question we have time for. We had somebody who asked, how is it in 2011 on an organic farm that we're referring to nitrogen as the only measure of fertility? Could you, could you re repeat that again? Um, yes, he wanted to know, how is it that we're referring to nitrogen as the only measure of fertility? Um, something that I, I'm not sure I really underst completely understand the question. Uh, Stephen, you? I, I think I know where, where this is going. Um, so in, in some of these farms that, were, that, that this was documented, I guess I think you're referring to, to Bill uh, Mason's farm, so I should probably let him answer this question. But our soils tend to not be uh, as phosphorus limiting in, in those regions because that's a, a management uh, constraint in, in, in the, uh, on the eastern shore. Um, uh, Bill, would you like to add to that? I mean, I think we, we concluded that it was uh, nitrogen limiting on that site, and that was the major factor of driving that ride performance. Well, I agree with you. The, uh, the problem that we have here on the shore is that uh, uh, and I think a lot of organic farmers have is providing enough nitrogen for to grow corn crop, and so therefore, uh, most of the time when you're talking about growing organic corn, it's where you get your nitrogen from, whether it be the cover crop, uh, manure, or uh, some other source, organic source, and uh, uh, it's consequently uh, it's all we talk about is where we're getting our nitrogen from, how much manure can we apply, we our phosphorus is getting too high, and things of that nature. So it's it's a constant problem for us. Okay, well, we're running out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. And as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions, you can use the Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. This webinar will be posted on the eOrganic website at extension.org slash organic underscore production under archived webinars along with our other recordings. Thank you so much for coming again today, Bill, Stephen, and Bill, and thank you all for joining us.